All right, I think we should be recording now. So uh, today our speaker is Michael Ford. He's from the Caribbean, from Trinidad at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. Um, he will be introduced today by one of our students here, Suvan Campbell. Suvan is a biochemistry pre-med senior, also in the honors program here at Andrews University. He is president uh, this year of our chemistry club and vice president for the honors society, chemistry honors society. Also vice president for Gamma Sigma Epsilon and the South Asian Student Association. He's very involved. Um, in the future, he plans to go to medical school um, and specialize in sports medicine as an orthopedic surgeon. So our co-host for today, Suvan, it's your, your turn. Yeah. So our guest speaker for today is Dr. Michael M. Ford, who got his master's in chemistry at the University of Edinburgh and a PhD in chemistry at Cardiff University. Uh, he currently is a senior lecturer in chemistry and coordinates the major in, in industrial chemistry at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. And he also leads a research group that works on sustainable biomass transformations that have potential for implementation in a Caribbean perspective. He, he also owns a cosmetic manufacturing business and serves as an executive board member of Commonwealth Chemis Chemistry. And he has a supporting role in the Trinidad and Tobago Chemical Society. And today he will be talking to us about sustainable chemical production. All right. Thank you. Uh, just checking in, my audio is clear. Uh, thanks for the invitation today. I am actually sharing a space. I'm actually at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> not the university, because I was invited to a meeting here. Uh, and so I'm just doing this talk right after that meeting has ended. Uh, and so if my Wi-Fi goes down, I'm going to take the video, but I will, should still be able to hear me talk, right, if there's any fluctuations in the Wi-Fi. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I want to jump right in because I have 40 minutes uh, and chemists always have a lot to say, as you know. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about sustainable chemistry, uh, but really insights from the Caribbean region, since we are not known at the moment for sustainable chemical production, uh, which, as you know, is one of those very important SDG. Uh, in today's presentation, uh, the work I will be talking about is, has been done by Nakisha Ma, uh, Frida Kaufman, Ahmad Mohammed, and Lucy Costlywood in the UK. Uh, the first three persons uh, are or will my uh, PhD and for the PhD students. Uh, Nakisha is now graduated, and Frida is uh, about to submit her thesis. Uh, so this is the research group. We have one person in here who is not mentioned, she's Michaela, uh, and her project is stalled because she was just doing uh, a short project with us, but actually a quite important project. Uh, we do in sustainable chemicals also feeds into what she was doing. Uh, so this is one of those happy ones. It's a very small group, and the reason why I mentioned that is because to understand the context of what we are doing, you also need to understand the context of uh, chemical research and sustainable chemistry in the Caribbean region itself. So I'm going to start with this slide, which shows the map, and the map is color-coded. Uh, and the color-coded map shows the percentage of low-carbon energy uh, as, a, as a sort of a function of, of GDPs uh, across the globe. And then in those... Uh, cutouts that you're seeing, you're looking at how much money uh, moves around the number of jobs that are in that particular area. So it's sort of evident here that the only places that have successfully implemented on a large scale, low carbon energy or decarbonization, uh, Brazil over here, I, I suggest you can see my cursor, right? Yes, we can. Yeah, but just making sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the Scandinavian countries. 
Uh, and the rest of the world, including the US, uh, China, India, etc., has some, but not, not a lot. Of course, data from the African continent and some of Latin America, uh, particularly from the Caribbean region, is not forthcoming. But if we look at the amount of money that's been invested on the jobs, we see, for example, over here, uh, $866 billion in the chemical industry, and there are 6 million jobs. When we uh, look, for example, at the EU, $1.3 trillion, 19 million jobs. So we see that these are really chemical industry actually hires a lot of people. However, in some areas, not a lot of money is generated from the chemical industry for the amount of people that actually are hired and working in those industries. So where we are, we're in the Caribbean uh, and our R&D spend is actually quite low. I'm at the bottom right. We spend about 0.6% of GDP. Uh, the flag on top is the Jamaican flag. Trinidad flag is below. Uh, and both of us spend about 0.6% GDP. But our economy is actually quite different. 6% of a small amount, our budget runs about, let us say, 10, 10 billion US dollars a year. That's a, that's a tiny bit that we actually spend on research and development across all sectors, not only in education and academia. However, if we look at the industrialized countries, uh, in 2017, there was a 51 billion US dollar spend on R&D for chemical industry alone. And of course, all of that money is now being funneled into research on sustainable materials, renewable energy, etc. Right. And so we would like to change that and we would like to uh, contribute to the economies of our region uh, by developing mechanisms that we could uh, create jobs as well as innovate, uh, have patterns, create knowledge, et cetera, in chemistry and specifically in sustainable chemical production. So we want that 0.6% to go up. And the only way to do that is actually to demonstrate that we can actually be a global player in terms of chemical production from the standpoint of sustainable materials. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, however, is actually a global player, one of the largest exporters of methanol and ammonia globally. And so, but that footprint is all based on fossil fuels. Uh, so in the Caribbean region, uh, the uptake of renewable energy and related renewable chemicals hasn't been that great as the graph would show, right? Uh, the total installed uh, megawatt uh, capacity uh, is actually quite low overall in the region. Some countries, for example, like Trinidad and Tobago has no uh, recorded renewable energy capacity at the moment. Very few countries actually do. Uh, and so we, on the... I suppose the steep end of the curve in terms of implementation of renewables. However, I have figured out very recently, and today I was actually attending a meeting about this symposium I attended was about that, was that we actually have enough of the renewable energy resources that we don't have to depend on oil and gas resources at all in the Caribbean. The new strategy is to produce hydrogen, uh, which is another topic of discussion. Uh, but it links to what we're doing because to transform biomass molecules, which is what we, we actually need hydrogen. And we can't transform renewable biomass with non-renewable hydrogen. That doesn't very much sense. So when we look at it, we have another player here. I'm sure some people may be aware uh, that several countries, particularly those of the EU, are soon going to be taxing uh, commodities we call a carbon tax that are made with non-renewable resources. Uh, and from where we sit as an exporter of fertilizers, ammonia, methanol, et cetera, uh, cement as well, uh, that doesn't bode well for us because therefore we have uh, we lose our preferential market entry. And therefore it's really important that we start to develop uh, chemicals that are green uh, from the standpoint of the carbon chain. I'm just going to skip over that. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you an example of a project before going into the a little bit more about the different chemistries that we have. Uh, an example of a project that we conceived around, believe it or not, you see this lovely uh, this lovely guy here, this mosquito, uh, mm -hmm. and we're all aware of the, the sustained uh, negative impact of mosquitoes around the world. Uh, diseases that are carried, they're a huge vector. Uh, we have a lot of problems with mosquitoes as well. Uh, the cost to the Latin American and Caribbean region, the LAP region, is actually $3 billion. So we lose $3 billion in revenue, right? 
uh, or we use $3 billion in fighting uh, mosquito-borne diseases, et cetera. Now, if you look at how these are approached, usually we fund public health stuff, we build new hospitals, more pills, better awareness, uh, but nobody actually tackles the problem. The problem is not the awareness, the problem is actually the mosquito, right? And so to do that, of course, you need an insecticide. So what is done is that companies actually adopt these best-in-class insecticides. Uh, people respond eventually by saying they're harmful to health, we don't want them. So then the market says do natural. Uh, no, natural insecticides, natural herbicides, natural pesticides, all of these things are uh, the fad, everybody's into that. However, if we actually look at the science, and this is proven and published in, in several journals, most of these natural insecticides don't actually work at all. Very, very low efficacy. And so people then go back to the necessity of synthetic molecules, many of which are harmful to human health and also the environment. So we saw, for example, a gap there with making naturals that work. Uh, of course, my chemistry is not exactly into making insecticides, uh, but we were interested in how our chemistry that I will show you in a moment can actually support something like this, what this type of industry. So as a chemist, you go back to the drawing board. Well, what is the best natural insecticide? Actually, it's a molecule called PMD, paramethindione. And this particular molecule is, can be made from citral. Now, it turns out that the only proven, uh, proven effective natural, uh, naturally occurring insecticide extract, as you will, comes from a plant called lemon eucalyptus, which naturally has uh, a significant amount of PMD. In it, and that's an essential oil product that is patented and sold. Unfortunately, that plant does not grow, nor can it grow successfully uh, in our tropical regions. Uh, but however, we do have a lot of lemongrass. We call this lemongrass fever grass because traditionally people use this uh, when you have a fever, they boil it and drink it as a tea. Uh, and it works really well to reduce it, reduce your fever within hours. Now, citral to PMD, this is some decent organic chemistry here if you can do it well. Uh, but what we considered is that after we do this, we actually left over with a lot of biomass from that. And so our research is actually over here in biomass utilization. So the coupling of that sort of chemistry uh, with the classical organic uh, transformations can actually lead to a win-win. We started a project in how to do this, both transformations using green chemistry techniques. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit today, particularly about fufural hydrogenation, and levulinic acid hydrogenation, since that supports the total use of the plant material uh, and supports the economics in this case, but that sort of uh, implementation of citral to PNB. Yeah. So we start the chemistry bit now, uh, and I'm going to try to present it in a general manner. There's a lot of work here, and we're just going to cherry pick a few fine points we designed a project, uh, Frida Kaufman, one of my students, myself, around the use of uh, levulinic acid, which is a platform molecule. We can make a lot of things from it. We're particularly interested in this gamma valerolactone, uh, which is a green solvent, but also has use in synthesis. This is hydro classic hydrogenation chemistry, uh, well-documented. A lot of people have done it. Of course, we can do other things, but we are, we are interested in this route. Uh, levulinic acid is commercially available by a biofine process. It's not too expensive, so we don't need to solve grass to levulinic acid here. Uh, but we were thinking, if we do this, we need hydrogen. Where is it coming from? And we designed this uh, project around the use of glycerol, which is a polyol, uh, and waste product or byproduct of biodiesel production is actually pretty cheap. And so we're going to find, can we use glycerol to produce hydrogen by APR, which is already reported for some catalysts, but then also use that hydrogen in situ in the same reactor to upgrade our level in acid to a value-added product. And uh, this sort of coupling chemistry is not easy, since, of course, you need to match the rates of hydrogen production to rates of hydrogen utilization. The sites that may do the hydrogen production from glycerol on our catalyst, because we're doing heterogeneous catalysis may not actually be the same sites that will activate the levulinic acid molecule. So you have to find the right material to do this. So we will talk a little bit about what we did. Our targets are one pot catalytic process, 
Of course, using metal catalyst, nano catalyst, as I will show. So we want a low metal loading. We want to use those metals efficiently because we're doing green chemistry, but we also want to use a small amount of catalyst. So we know our catalyst be really very active. Uh, and of course, we want to use green solvents. In this case, we're using water as the solvent. So the biomass step is level in the gambler lactone is challenging, particularly because many catalysts become deactivated as you build the valerolactone up, or because this is acidic solution, many catalysts actually leach in this case. Uh, ruthenium is very active for this reaction. We wanted to stay away from ruthenium, although the uh, full frail work is on ruthenium. We tend to, to use uh, Earth's abundant metals like iron and copper, nickel, etc. Uh, in this case, we haven't been able to tweak this system to that, so I'll show you the work done with platinum and palladium. Uh, but usually this is done under high pressure of hydrogen and well above 200 degrees Celsius. So not really an uh, energy efficient process. So what have we done? Uh, in my days of PhD, which was a good while now, what, 12 years ago or so when I was doing this stuff, uh, leveling acid conversion was reported in the literature on platinum-based catalysts. Uh, I was interested in how do I reduce the amount of requirement of overpressure of hydrogen, uh, which I did by cutting a 1.7% platinum on titanium dioxide catalyst. You could see here, uh, the material is reusable. We get mostly GVL, some hydroxyvaleric acid, just a secondary product. Uh, the take home points is that water is the solvent. So this is green. The product is usually separate, separatable from water. We have actually a very high ratio of the substrate, which is levelinic acid to the metal. Uh, and so the turnover numbers are very high here. Uh, it has good recyclability in batch, low platinum loading. Uh, we found out after this that 1.7% is too much platinum. We can actually go down to 0.5% platinum. Uh, and this works really well. Just soon on the next slide. So we also looked at the platinum content and we saw that if we went down to 0.5% platinum, we weren't actually sacrificing the overall turnover number, which means that most of the platinum there was not necessary. I'll show you what this catalyst looked like in terms of the uh, transition electron microscopy in a minute. But we could do an ultra low loading platinum and get the same effect. And uh, there seems to be some size dependence. We're working on that. But we have quantitative, quantitative production of the GVL. So the reaction works well. We could do this part. If you look here and the conditions, it's quite hot, 150 degrees. Uh, we're using a lot of uh, hydrogen. We do have a relatively concentrated solution of levelinic acid. Uh, this reaction doesn't take very long to go to quantitative uh, completion. We found that other precious metals work, but it's difficult to get the iron, copper, nickel, that sort of thing to work well for this. And that is another challenge that we have since we want to move away from using the platinum group metals. So I'll show you what the catalyst looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. The technique here uh, produces very small nanoparticles as well as single atoms. So this here, for example, single atom, you can see it with the dotted lines and sub nanometer clusters uh, of most metals. So we can do this with palladium, platinum, uh, ruthenium, iron, copper, nickel, iridium, gold, silver. Uh, the technique works for very many metals on the surface. And there's also really good interaction between those nanoparticles and the surface. And this material has been published already. I just want to show you what the catalyst looks like. And in fact, all of our materials uh, have sort of a similar particle size dimension when we do the analysis, uh, irrespective of the metal that we put on the catalyst, on the titanium or aluminium, silica surfaces, etc. So the idea is to do a coupled reaction. Right? We want to take levelinic acid. We've said we can do that. Now we look at the glycerol. What can we do? We found that when we uh, expose glycerol, and this is not waste glycerol. This is uh, glycerol bought from Sigma Alridge, right? So this is cleaned up glycerol. Uh, when we expose that glycerol uh, to these catalysts uh, at different temperatures, and particularly the best temperatures, 220 degrees, actually we found that the glycerol was converted to propane dial. Now that is known. 
what we also found was that we had an excess of hydrogen in the gas phase of this reaction. So above the reaction is a headspace, and it was uh, full of hydrogen. And so at that point, we said, well, if there's hydrogen, we should be able to couple these reactions. Okay? So what you're looking at here, these uh, blue bars show the PDO yield. This is about just under 60% in the case of the platinum catalyst. Uh, the second entry is where we put a 10% cholesterol solution. So although this looks like less PDO yield, the turnover frequency is higher because we have a lot more cholesterol there uh, being converted. So the catalyst, actually, we haven't uh, optimized this just yet. Uh, this is the mixed material, which I showed on the previous slide, which is this one here, where both of the platinum and palladium are in the same nanocore by metallic. So there's some synergy to look at because if we put the physical mixes together, which is platinum by itself and platinum by itself is not as good. Uh, we haven't gone on to do that because we're really interested in the coupling uh, and the coupling really works very well with uh, platinum alone and not palladium. So just to uh, sort of, I suppose, uh, convince you here, the green curve is the utilization of our substrate glycerol, uh, the sort of reddish one. This is a diol production from it, which is a usable, sellable green commodity and product. And the blue line is hydrogen. And we can see as time goes by, we continue to produce more hydrogen. And what's happening here actually is that the hydrogen that's being produced is upgrading the actual glycerol to PDO itself. So there's no external hydrogen, no fossil fuel hydrogen needed for this. This happens in the reactor. Uh, it works really well. The question is what happens when we add levelinic acid to this system? Uh, if we do that, actually, the levelinic acid produces GVL in the same way as we said before, uh, in this case, uh, depending on the temperature, of course, the reaction uh, kinetics changes. But it does produce GVL and almost quantitatively in the case of doing it at 190 degrees. Now, this graph is, is from work that's done with the hydrogen coming from the glycerol itself. So here we've managed to uh, couple those two reactions together. Uh, and in the table below, we tried to compare the reaction uh, rates if we had external hydrogen, which is what everyone else is doing, versus if we use glycerol as a hydrogen donor. And actually, we could see that the TOFs does approach the same region. And so we believe the mechanism is actually uh, somewhat similar in both cases. The question, of course, is this generally applicable? So can we also do other hydrogenation reactions with glycerol? That's a big question. Uh, we have been able to go back in the lab to do that since we've also moved on to other things. This is sort of the end of that PhD. Uh, project and there's a lot of work on characterization of the catalyst, etc. Uh, use of different metals and um, to try and do the same thing because we, as I said, we want to move away from the platinum group metals. So uh, this reaction works with glycerol. In the literature, you would see isopropyl alcohol and ethanol being used a lot. Uh, of course, IPA is not green. Uh, ethanol can be renewable, so that's a possibility. Uh, but actually, we see that we can get as good as or better uh, reactivity out of the system with glycerol, uh, depending on the temperature that we use. And we still actually do have some hydrogen left over. So here we have a system where we take a waste molecule, a biomass platform molecule, we produce a valuable, sellable green molecule out of the waste, which is PDO, but we also produce uh, GVL as well out of the biomass precursor. Uh, almost quantitatively in this case, and the catalyst works well, and it is uh, reusable, which is important, right? It's, it is reusable. Uh, so this work was pretty neat. We're actually writing up this work right now uh, to publish this because this particular uh, reaction hasn't been reported this way, particularly because uh, of the type of catalyst and the fact that our catalysts have such very small nanoparticles, which also have not been uh, reported in the time. So that is one example of this sustainable chemical production. Um, I'm looking at the time to make sure we can get through the second one. Uh, this is a, a slightly more involved project, and so I will give a few highlights from it. Uh, Levelinic acid is one platform. Uh, Fufral is another that has been 
researched uh, ad nausea over the past decade and a half. Uh, so it's actually difficult to publish peripheral hydrogenation work because of the amount of work that has uh, been completed in this area. We were interested in how we could make bimetallic catalysts that control selectivity. As you see on your screen with this sort of scheme or reaction pathway, that this reaction network, this is the fulfrile molecules at time. Uh, and you can easily see here that the fulfrile was the fulfrile alcohol, which is somewhat preferred. But there are lots of other pathways, potentially rearrangement pathways. We have pathways where we can get diols from it. Uh, we can get pentanol, for example. Uh, there's also decarbonylation products like furans, which most people don't wish to report. Uh, methyl furan and MTHF, these are all usable commodities in their own right. However, uh, as you see, each step does require more and more hydrogen. And of course, if that hydrogen is coming from fossil fuel, then it gets uh, less and less green as we continue to produce other products. So we looked at this and decided that we wanted to make fulfill alcohol selectively, which I will tell you, spoiler alert, is not easy to do because once you make the profile alcohol, it actually makes other things uh, very readily. Uh, and so you have to design your system really well, particularly because of human formation. This profile will uh, polymerize on its own in the reactor, especially if you're heating the stuff up over 100 degrees in water for humans. Uh, in fact, you need to distill the profile every time you use it from the bottle because of human formation. Uh, and decarbonylation is, is somewhat... Uh, a serious issue depending on the type of catalyst that you use. Basically, you take off the CO, this carbonyl group, and you end up with furans after hydrogen. So we uh, made a number of catalysts. What I left out before was that the uh, lovely TM that you saw was from a catalyst made by chemical vapor impregnation, which we do in our lab using a particular type of precursors that have high vapor pressure, low temperature, they sublime easily. Uh, traditionally, people use incipient wetness and chloride or nitrate precursors. Uh, we've also tried what is called solvatumal synthesis, which means we made the support material, the titanate, and put the metal down at the same time. And then we have a hybrid. So these uh, acronyms refer to the different types of materials. Uh, we're really interested in the CVI and hybrid. The hybrid is where we make uh, preformed nanowire or nano. Uh, nanostructure, and then we use this, we put the metal down by CVI on it uh, to see if the synthesis technique and the steps in the technique affects the catalytic activity. So we're using ruthenium here. Uh, we started with ruthenium because, of course, ruthenium is well reported in literature, and we wanted to uh, find a way to reduce the amount of ruthenium which we have by coupling with other metals. We will talk about coupling to iron and coupling to copper as a sort of co-catalyst in this reaction. So here we have the ruthenium. These are made by different methods. Uh, you can see that the selectivity differs, although the conversion is always 100% under these conditions. Um, interestingly, this catalyst produces 1,2-pentane diol, which is not always seen uh, in the literature. So that is interesting. Here, uh, the production of THF, A, et cetera, is because the fulfil alcohol that's produced actually goes on. So if you did that time online, you would start seeing fulfil alcohol, then THF, A, et cetera, like that. Uh, but what we found is that this is a 2 weight percent catalyst. That's important. Uh, and after we did all of this, what we found out actually we only needed about 0.5% ruthenium to make this work really well. Uh, and so the the catalyst itself can have a lot less of the precious metal uh, on it and work well. And so the other materials we use, actually, we brought down the content to one weight percent. Okay. Now, the lack of selectivity in this uh, is of concern to me, although most people say, well, you're making products that are usable. So selectivity is not such an issue, but we want to we really want to follow the reaction and follow where those uh molecules absorb the surface where those bonds are broken and reformed by new ways. And you can't do that sort of thing if you want to do some 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 fancy in situ or operando studies if you have so many products, right? So we're looking for a system in which we can make a particular product selectively, although industry would say the cyclopentanol or pentanone and the one to PDO is actually uh, quite useful. 
So we decided we add a little copper in. Well, what happens when we add copper? Uh, it's sort of a I saw the bimodal story. In one case, in some catalysts, you can see here uh, one four pedio. Now this has again, this is a this new piece of data. We've reproduced this many times to make sure it's correct, um, because this is not produced on most of the other catalysts that we've seen in the literature. And this system we haven't studied in terms of the uh, characterization of the surface, since we focus on the CVI and the hybrid materials. Um, in the case of the CVI, there is a, this bar here, as you can see, is other. And that means that we have products that we don't know what they are. Unfortunately, some are gaseous products. A lot of them are intermediates in the liquid phase. So this catalyst is actually pretty useless uh, in terms of the overall scheme. Uh, because we can't quantify the rest of the products. We don't know what they are. They're there, they're carbon-based, but we don't know what they are. Of course, uh, in the other systems, we have a lot of THFA, which is okay, so it's not too bad. Uh, however, the idea here was to replace some of the ruthenium with copper, and we see that the copper isn't very good uh, in this case, and that's probably because of the size of those copper particles. They're too small, right? They're less than two nanometers and there are lots of sub-nanometer clusters. Of course, the next question is, uh, what is the form of the metal? Because we have two metals on the same surface. Is this an alloy? Are they separate on the surface? And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we did the same thing with iron, better results. Um, the iron catalyst seems to be a lot more selected to fruitful alcohol. So now we actually have a system that we could study in terms of uh, those sorts of in situ and operando studies to see you know, how the molecule binds to the surface, where is the active site, et cetera. Um, this, these catalysts tend to be really good. They're also quite, they're also reusable. Uh, iron itself is not active for this reaction, right? This has very poor activity, uh, low carbon balance. The subject gets absorbed on the surface or forms. Uh, humans. Okay? So we're really interested in these two materials, the iron copper CVI, iron, and sorry, iron ruthenium CVI and iron ruthenium uh, hybrid material. Incidentally, uh, just to add, no, we won't show characterization for this system, uh, but of course, once we saw that that data, and then said to the student, well, why can't we couple uh, iron and copper together, right? Since both of them are uh, transition metals, they're yeah, abundant. We did that, uh, and to our surprise, actually, the iron copper system works as well as the ruthenium system. And this is data we're writing up now to publish. Uh, and this, again, is, is it's new. Nobody saw that working this way, and it's actually very selective to fluoride alcohol. Now, the solvatomal S and the hybrid material is actually a sodium titanate and not titanium dioxide, P25, which, which we use for most of our studies because it's easy to get. These are materials we made in-house and have obviously had to characterize. Now, in this case, of course, we only have 28% metal overall. So again, this is all feeding into those uh, targets that we have. The temperature is not too hot, 130 degrees. Uh, of course, we do need to do some, I would say, optimization to see how far we could push this system. And of course, the, the big issue is, is it reusable? I will tell you, although it's not in this presentation, the iron, this one is reusable. The CVI example and the solvatomal example is not as reusable as the hybrid one. Uh, and some studies need to uh, be done around that. This iron copper also works on a variety of supports, aluminum, silica, uh, zirconia, et cetera. And so this is a nice system to study for general applicability. Can these materials be used for hydrogenation chemistry? Uh, across the board, not only for this particular uh, molecule as a platform. Okay. As I, I just said that the materials do have some uh, sodium in them because sodium uh, is in the titanium uh, structure, sodium titanate, uh, and we were interested in, does that actually really affect the reaction or not? Is it that the metal combination makes it selective or is it that the sodium or sodium oxide that is present on the surface increases the selectivity. Uh, and so we had to do some clever experiments. One of them was actually to make a sodium free titanate, uh, which I would tell you we spent about six to nine months on, uh, following a lot of literature that was been published in reputable journals by groups and could not reproduce any of their titanates. Uh, in fact, when we did the full analysis, we found in most of them, they actually had a significant amount of sodium uh, and it was not reported in their papers. 
uh, so sodium free was very difficult to do. Uh, and we're still grappling with that. We developed a method to do that, to make those sodium free titanates in house at the moment. Uh, continuing this testing actually, because we need to figure out what is the uh, effect of that uh, alkaline metal or the, even the alkaline metals. So we look at some characterization work. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on elemental mapping using eels or edax because we're interested in finding out what is the form of the iron, the copper, and the ruthenium on the surface. Uh, so you see here the uh, particle of titanium dioxide is covered with, in this case, you can see the orange color is the iron. So the iron actually, look, the bar is five nanometers long. So the iron is actually like a film of iron on the surface. The particles are so tiny. The ruthenium you can see here in this purple color, it's between maybe two to three nanometers. There's some larger, some smaller particles. Uh, when we put them together, we could barely see any iron and ruthenium mixing in that case. But in the case of the copper catalyst, you could uh, just circle over here. You could see where the copper and the iron, the blue and the purple are actually in the same spot. Uh, in many cases, of course, there are some cases where we have separate copper or ruthenium particles. Uh, and so we believed at that point that there was some sort of alloying going on between metals and therefore that was affecting the uh, selectivity and where we had metals separate, for example, like these particles of copper on the surface, uh, they were doing their own thing. And that's why the copper catalyst was uh, such a naughty a naughty catalyst, not giving us what we wanted, because we have these copper species that are separate doing their own thing on the surface. Uh, I will tell you that that is actually not the story. <laughs> we continue the analysis. But that's what we get by some very expensive high resolution T and data. You can see the particle size overall and not showing size graph. These are just the larger particles to show how they're mixed, but it's about just under two nanometers in both cases. Uh, the iron copper is also similar, where we have associations of iron and copper together. On the outside of the catalyst, the material uh, has very, very small nano particles as well. Uh, but the mixing is not as evident in this case, which we knew from before because I had some earlier work on iron copper zeolites, which showed that there was no uh, electronic mixing of the copper and the iron in that case, and it seems to still be the case. The other system that we use as we're coming down here is uh, the hybrid one in which we see titanate nanowires. Uh, and in all of these, cases, the iron is still is dispersed, highly dispersed on the surface. Uh, in case of the iron copper, the copper seems to be embedded in the iron film. Uh, in the case of the ruthenium copper, they seem to be at the same space if we look at the maps. And so maybe they are alloyed. And also in the case of the iron ruthenium, we think there's possible alloy because they're associated in the same particles. Uh, and so it's easy to write a paper and say, listen, this stuff is alloyed, the alloys are electronic alloys, the band structure is changed, the atmosphere is changed. Uh, and so this is responsible for the differences in selectivity that we see. The particle size is actually roughly the same for the uh, iron, uh, ruthenium, and the copper, ruthenium, biometallics again. So we went back recently and uh, got some excess uh, kindly done by Lucy in the UK. She's at UCL, UK facility. And I think this is the best way to show it. What we're actually looking at here, we're trying to figure out is ruthenium bonded to copper or to iron. Uh, and so this is just an example from another paper. We do this wavelet analysis from the data. And you can see that when we have here, this is palladium and the other one is palladium cobalt. When the palladium cobalt are together, the wavelet analysis looks a lot different. So we went back, of course, we did our ruthenium, and then we just show you what happens. This, these are the severe catalysts. Basically, they all look the same. We put iron in it, we put copper in it, it looks the same as the basic ruthenium. So there's really no evidence of alloying, even though the TM shows that they're actually in the same space. So although they're in the same space, they're not actually electronically alloyed. They're just sharing a space. Uh, and we did a lot of other work around this because it would be difficult to, to, to prove or disprove that without having good standards. And so that's why we had to go back and run the iron titanium uh, made by the same method with the same precursors and the same support material. We go again in the titanate materials. It's the same story. Uh, in the titanate, the ruthenium is actually ruthenium oxide, mostly, as opposed to ruthenium metal, which is in the 
TiO2 uh, samples. Uh, and the wavelength analysis shows us that the material looks roughly the same. So this is the base. This is when we add the copper. And over here is when we add the iron. Looks the same. And so again, no evidence of alloying. So we have a case where we have two conflicting bits of data. One says it might be alloyed, the other one says it's not. Uh, this is probably more definitive because those yields maps, which people normally use to show alloying, uh, really doesn't tell you if they are mixed, it just tells you they're in the same space, right? And so this is a bit more definitive in that case. What is happening here actually is a change in oxidation state of these metals. So we have the titanium-based catalyst and the titanate-based catalyst uh, and for the same metal combination, the titanates are always, the ruthenium is always more oxidized in that case versus the CVI materials, right? Uh, and these, especially when these materials are giving trouble is because the metal is actually in zero oxidation state. It's being reduced. So the iron is really found as iron three plus, mostly a little bit of iron zero. The copper is found as copper two plus. After reaction, however, which I'm not going to show, the, these metals are actually reduced after reaction. Uh, making this particular, these catalysts, particularly the TiO2 ones, not reusable. Uh, in the case of here, we have again the titanate systems before and after. What happens, uh, and it's no surprise because you put it under hydrogen uh, in a reactor at 120 degrees for four hours, hydrogen is in the gas phase, the material becomes more reduced. Yes. Uh, iron and the copper being in the same space as ruthenium. And in case of the titan, as well, it becomes more oxidized. So this is actually a, sorry, more reduced again. So this is the same effect. Uh, what we actually found was that in case of the TiO2 samples, a lot of the copper and the iron was lost or leached in that system, whereas the sodium seems to have stabilized those metal species. Uh, and those catalysts are reusable as compared to the type TiO2 type materials. So uh, it's worth doing some detailed analysis if you could uh, beyond the techniques that might be more readily available. So that, I'm just gonna stop this. I have a few minutes left. Yes, there's, yes. So one of us more, we have like five uh, left. Give us a summary in the next two minutes. Right, yes. So, so that uh, particular work has been done where we're going, we're actually going to reproduce those reactions we've talked about. Uh, but now we want to use uh, sunlight-driven catalysis, photocatalysis to do the same work. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but I, what I would say uh, is that it's totally and entirely possible to do those reactions without that heat and without that external hydrogen, uh, utilizing hydrogen donors to do that uh, as in situ processes. And this is where we're at now sort of re-engineering our reactors and our reactions to get those same reactions to work uh, in a more sustainable manner. And uh, this uh, work has been done by a number of people and our targets are always uh, to meet all of those principles of green chemistry, uh, but also to do uh, reactions and research that makes sense in terms of implementation in the future. We get to that uh, sort of stage of development to build that in from the front so that we have um, uh, technology which can drop into others uh, that are useful for industry. I think I'm going to stop there because we're not going to talk about photocatalysis that will carry us way over time, uh, as interesting as it is. Uh, of course, I want to just thank um, everyone who has assisted in this work, which is a lot of people. Uh, we don't have many, uh, we have infrastructure resources which may not be suitable for the type of work I'm doing. Uh, most of people in our research groups do analytical chemistry and uh, synthesis work from natural products, et cetera. And being the lone uh, catalysis person and also the lone catalysis person in, in uh, sustainable catalysis, we do have to partner with a lot of people. Uh, and I, of course, hope that eventually we'll also partner with your somebody from your university uh, so that we can increase those collaborations and partnerships uh, and also learn from you as you learn from us. Uh, thank you for your attention and invitation. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Ford. I really appreciated the talk. Uh, before I open the floor for questions, I do have a question of my own that I would like to ask. Mm -hmm. So for the results from the 
peripheral hydrogenation. What method did you use to characterize what okay, was so we're using uh, GC, FID techniques. Uh, right now, because we have a new GCM SMS, we're going back to that. Uh, and we're thinking to revisit HPLC methods, just to be sure, because we have been actually able in using some newer methods to find some of those products in the last two to three months, which didn't appear before uh, because they, they weren't visible, put and quote, on the color, right? Uh, and so, but so we're primarily using GCFID for that for detection. All right, then if anyone else has any questions, now is your time. So I have a question about your starting material. So mm -hmm. currently you're using Furfural as the starting material for a lot of your yes. studies. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered using HMF, which is the hydroxymethyl Furfural for the-, for uh, the Yes. That so a uh, student just started with that meeting in September. So I had a student before working on that project, uh, but he dropped out of the chemistry program altogether. Uh, so we restarted that in September. What we're doing there, we obviously want to do HMF to FDCA, uh, but we're focusing on photocatalysis because we had some data before showing that we could we could do that reaction well. Uh, so his student just started in September. Just this morning, he showed me he was making the HMF. Uh, he was asking some advice on purification, et cetera. Yeah, so you're right. The advantage, or at least one of the advantages with HMF is that it's already part of what um, could be a renewable resource. It's obtained yes. from sugars. And, you know, um, that's something that could be from sugarcane or beets or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, Very easily. You get it. Yeah. Um, the other question I have is about the titanium dioxide. I noted that you use other um, oxides, um, but I'm just wondering if there is a specific role why for the that I'm assuming it's a support um, for the the metals, but is there any sort of um, evidence that it might be um, uniquely suited, or could you use something like zinc oxide or even silica, um, silicon dioxide, which could make the process um, less expensive? So actually, uh, we're using it as a support. We found that depending on the reaction and the metal composition that we put on the surface, uh, aluminium could work, zinc oxide, uh, not sorry, not zinc, zirconium oxide, aluminium, silica, we've tried as well. Uh, the work that we're doing, what we really want to do is move away from that together. And the idea we have with the copper iron because the copper works in the iron works and we put that the iron is a film on the surface of very small particles which copper is embedded. We actually need to make iron nanoparticles and iron oxide nanoparticles. Since if you look at the footprint of that versus TIA2, it's actually a footprint of the environmental impacts. And so can we make those nanomaterials from iron and then put the copper and the ruthenium on it? And I think that's the next stage that we're looking at. So the uh, support materials can be changed, but the stability of the support could be a problem depending on the substrate. Okay. Um, anybody else? No? I have one last I've got question. a question. Okay. I got one. Okay. Um, very interesting talk. Love the characterization. I'm kind of an analytical chemist and and uh, just the interesting use of the catalysis and studying that. But you mentioned, I think, like briefly that could you might be able to reuse some of the catalyst? Maybe is there? Could you uh, speak to that? How reusable are the catalysts? Uh, hmm. Yeah, what do you know about that? Okay, so our our testing is limited. I would say to academic lab scale testing or reactors. So we so what we do is we reuse the materials three times or four times and then do a regeneration step and see if it changes. So the hmm. sodium titanate materials are reusable. They, you get back the same um, turnover frequency and similar or better selectivity after regeneration. 
but the TiO2 materials aren't because the methyl actually becomes leached because of the uh, solution is slightly acidic, the profile and water is slightly acidic, and it leaches the metal. Uh, so some are reusable, some are not. What we've actually been studying in the last six months is why they are reusable or not. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, looking at the, uh, the crystallite dimensions, for example, we see the titanium dioxide, actually the particle size increases by about 40% as well, those particles on the surface, and we have a loss in crystallinity of the TiO2. So we looked at that by XRD and TM. Uh, so those materials aren't the best because remember it's, it's air oxide, so it's actually quite small, it's 10 to 20 nanometer particles. Uh, but uh, in, industrially, you probably want to use TiO2 that has the larger particle size yeah. because they're, they're more stable. Very interesting, thank you. So one last question um, from me. Um, the feasibility of um, the lemongrass production, mm -hmm. right? What is what is the analysis on that? That's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, which so, I'm going to answer from a commercial standpoint. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, uh, some of the challenges uh, would be raw material, getting the quantity of raw material, because you need to do this on a scale that you're producing tons of uh, lemongrass oil, mm -hmm. because that's going to produce hundreds of tons of bio waste biomass to feed a process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't currently have that, but there are actually plans on the way for uh, Grenada, as well as Trinidad, to start producing lemongrass. Uh, so last week I attended a session and uh, two people were talking about that, or two companies were looking at that as a value added product. They're not looking at making an insecticide, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's where I come in to say, actually, you could make a higher value product. They're looking at producing the material for use uh, as an essential oil in, in personal care right. items, etc. cetera, for export. Right. Um, so my thing is that we need to support that by developing chemistry that the whole plant can be used. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to end up with waste, and then that waste is going to end up somewhere. Right, right, right. Yeah. So there is a lot of um, a lot of thought has to be put into where this lemongrass will grow, um, the soil mm -hmm. conditions, all that type of stuff. So, is as far as you know, the ministries of agriculture part of this? You know, and uh, not particularly these are those are solely commercial interests because commercial. Of lemongrass grows like crazy. If you go to Grenada, lemongrass is everywhere. <laughs> it's oh, like okay. a weed. Uh huge okay. clumps grow everywhere. Uh not so much in Trinidad. Uh we, we don't we produce it, you know, we don't have it running wild, but it is yeah. uh they will I think they're gonna handle that end because they're looking for commercial production. Uh and then what we want to do is give an, a, a viable option. For what can we produce that's going to be higher value and then right. hopefully then that feeds into the value chain and allows other players to come and get involved yeah because okay. it's actually quite easy crop to grow in the tropics okay okay very interesting we'll um have you check check back in with you see what yeah. progress we're making and uh see if we are able to develop a uh, sustainable lemongrass and um, downstream product industry. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Give, give it a year or two. I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to work. I just have to figure out the, the one part chemistry which I'm working on. That's right. Okay, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you guys have a good evening and to all the students. Uh, thanks for listening. All right. We'll be in touch. Okay. Bye-bye.